Okay, we are now recording, so fair warning to everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start. Um, so this session is all about adapting fitness for accessibility and inclusion, as I'm sure you can tell from the title. Um, we know at Disability Sports Coach just how important it is that everyone has the opportunity to be active um, for health and mental well-being and, you know, for their social life and for their just general happiness. Um, but particularly since COVID-19, I think we've all realised how many barriers there are for people to access sport and how e unevenly distributed those are. So if you have um, a disability or a chronic health condition or various other factors, there are even more challenges to staying active, which is something that we all have the right to do. So we want to give um, fitness instructors and everyone working in sport, whether they've got experience in working with people with disabilities or not, to become more aware and to adapt their sessions because um, it's easier to do in some ways than I think people might imagine. So that's why we've brought together Carly, who um, is a fitness instructor based in Bristol, but also online, who's been doing some great stuff recently. And Coach G, who of course has plenty of experience in coaching with DSC. So um, yeah, welcome everybody. And thank you, Carly and Grey, for joining us. Um, I was wondering if you would be willing to introduce yourself, Carly, and a little bit about your background. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this today. Um, I feel really nervous um, and I just hope that I can do, uh, you know, the charity justice with what I'm going to say. Um, so I'm a fitness instructor. I'm based in Bristol. Um, I've lived here for about four years after moving from London. Uh, I am married to a man called Stephen, who is a T9 complete paraplegic. Um, so he has use of, he, he said it's okay for me to share all this about him. Um, he has use of his um, upper body from about the belly button upwards. Um, and as a fitness instructor, um, I'm a bit of a tyrant with how we have to stay active in the house. So the poor man never gets rest. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, because uh, we like to do active things together, um, as much as I've kind of learned about uh, human bodies as I've been teaching um, I've learned lots from him uh, through experience about um, adapting things for um, particularly people who are uh, paralyzed um, and for people who are using wheelchairs so have little mobility um, and another thing I should probably just share um, about myself is that I grew up in Stoke Mandeville um, which is home of the paraplegic um, Paralympics um, and we've got um, the uh, kind of spinal injuries um, unit there at Stoke Mandeville Hospital and part of their rehabilitation program was actually to come to my primary school when I was a child. So we would do loads of sport with, um, it was men uh, who were in wheelchairs who just had spinal cord injuries. They would come and play basketball with us as kids. They would come and play tennis with us as kids. So it was very normal for me as a child to play lots of sport with people who were in wheelchairs. Um, so it's always been something which I've been aware of and it's just a very kind of normal thing for me to think about how to include as I've been a fit instructor. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Carly. That must have been so inspirational for you at such a young age to be able to see so much representation in your sessions. Um, Greer, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and the work that you do with lots of different organisations? Yeah, so my name is Greer Ailey, so people know me as Coach G. I'm a project officer here at Disability Sports Coach for the past seven months. Um, I'm also a freelance football coach with Girls United. Um, and I am a personal trainer as well. Yeah, just a brief introduction. Thank you both so much. Um, so I guess we, Carly, you've maybe touched on this already, but um, did you want to talk us a little bit more through why you decided to start developing seated workouts as part of your online session since lockdown and everything hit us? Yeah, of course. Um, so I've always said, I've always kind of said I'm, I offer inclusive and adaptable fitness um, and I know a lot of people use the word inclusive and I do kind of question other fitness instructors when they say yes we're inclusive and accessible okay be sure because if somebody arrives and you say sorry I can't do seated workouts I can't work with you if you're partially sighted etc it really throws them off and they're like oh well yeah I wouldn't really know what to do about that 
and I was like it's not good enough it's really not good enough to say you're accessible or inclusive and then forget a section of society who might want to move their bodies with you um I think coupled with that um my husband I saw as lockdown happened I think we were in a pretty kind of privileged position in that um you know we both still had our jobs we were at home a lot and I saw my husband able to access so much more um fitness online because he perhaps couldn't get into studios because of stairs before or people would just freak out that he was in a wheelchair and wouldn't know how to adapt their sessions for him so they would say sorry you can't come and do the session um and I just saw how kind of normalized it became for him to be included in sessions and sometimes he would do yoga sessions or boxing sessions wouldn't actually mention that he was a wheelchair user and just be accepted by that instructor into that session so I felt as I was developing my videos which is really important to if I'm going to say I'm accessible or inclusive to actually make specific seated workouts for people and not the kind of seated workouts where maybe I've been going to with my husband where people stand up halfway through or say okay right now we're going to do lunges holding onto the chair and this is you know this is an accessible workout and it's seated it's like it's actually really really like a horrible feeling to be halfway through a, um, an experience like that and suddenly people just don't think okay maybe if this is a seated workout there'll be people here who can't get up out of their chair so I just really wanted to make sure that for me the accessibility was particularly for people who were wheelchair users um, and I've kind of developed some of those videos based on all of those experiences. Fantastic and could you talk us through a little bit about your process in developing those how you approached it and things like that? Yeah um, so I spoke to my husband a lot obviously, I watch him exercise because I'm a tyrant and I'm always making sure he's doing it properly. <laughs> um, you know, when he's trying to work out, I'm like, right, are you doing this properly? Are you using your core? Um, it's no good just picking up heavy weights with your arms, I need to see your core engagement. And, um, so we had a lot of discussions, I would often kind of creepily watch him do his workouts and take notes, which he was not a fan of. Um, I watched a lot online, I did find that um, online you've either got kind of uh, workouts who are developed by people who have got similar disabilities and understand the kind of movement and needs there are some fantastic yoga and pt um trainers who uh, are um who do have disabilities when it comes to kind of spinal cord um injuries and so i watched a lot of what they do what they talk about and i tried to err away from the whole oh my goodness like um you know you're a superhuman you're so inspirational like you're such a uh, this is such an amazing thing that you can move and it's just like well people are people and I just want it to feel normal um, so it was a lot of kind of watching uh, researching and then testing stuff out on my core hobby really making him try things and see if that would work with his balance or if things were going to be too difficult and adapting them for him. that's great and Gurria from your perspective um, working with um, DSC and your previous work, why do you think it's so important that every fit instructor and everyone who's working with people in sport is able to adapt their sessions and aware of different accessibility requirements? Um, I think as a coach and an instructor myself, um, this is important because it's not only fundamental for the development of the sport they are coaching, but also the development of their participants and themselves as instructors. So in other words, it's not only about the sport, but the individual and their aims. Um, accessibility and inclusion is not only essential in building self-esteem, but it al also allows those who are often left on the fringes of society to be visible, to feel as though they're cared for and that their needs matter and that they matter. Um, I ensure that everything I do, including my work here at DSC, my work as a coach, trainer and mentor is grounded in visibility, accessibility and inclusion. Absolutely. So important. Thank you, Gria. And so let's kind of move on to some of the challenges that people might perceive that they would have in developing these kinds of um, adaptive workouts and inclusive workouts. Um, Kylie, what did you find were the main challenges or, you know, maybe things that you didn't expect to come across when you were developing the seated workouts? So I think um, one of the main things I had to do was check in with myself for my own um, non-disabled privilege, I think. I had to make sure that the words I was using uh, weren't going to alienate people. Um, I had to make sure, as I said before, that when I'm 
filming a seated workout I'm not kind of standing up to get stuff and actually just instantly alienating people who might think okay she gets it or she's providing this for for me and then I kind of do something that completely breaks that trust um so I also think it's difficult um because I was I've created my workout obviously based on my experience and based on the fact I live with someone who is paraplegic um you know when it comes to things like if uh, I do have other clients in the real world uh, somebody who's partially sighted um, somebody's got a fused spine so there are different disabilities so just to use the term disability um it's so you know I know that I've created accessible workouts but actually they're not accessible for every type of disability um so that again is something where I'm still having to be careful with the language I'm using saying yes I've created fully really inclusive accessible workouts I'm not under the um, impression that you know I've, okay right I've completed everything for every single person but I am still very aware and I'm just trying to remain humble and learn while it's happening and if people are giving me feedback actually listen to that from them and not just think I've got it right um because I don't know so I am here kind of learning and I'm here taking on information and adapting things as, as I go so I think those have been challenges it's also uh, I guess very scary to um uh branch out from what you know uh and say yep you know I'm good at this because people look at you as um, an expert and so it's been kind of scary to think okay people are trusting me as an expert here um but also make sure i'm put your hand up and say i'm still learning and i'm still humble and i need feedback from you as participants to help me get this right yeah, yeah that's important i think for other instructors as well to see that it is a process and you know it's not something that you suddenly arrive at being perfect that you know it's important to try even if it's a small adaptation to start with and then build on that with the feedback like you said so yeah I think that it's such a good example that you're setting for other people who might want to start becoming more inclusive yeah absolutely and Greer based on Carly's comments and also in general what do you think are some things that you would like fitness instructors and people working in sport to know when they're starting to you know, embed inclusivity and accessibility more into their workouts. Um, firstly, thanks, Carly. I completely agree. It's a, a, a learning process that you never stop. Um, I also have to reiterate some of what you said. Um, it, it, it may seem really scary and worrying initially, um, almost like stepping into unknown territory. One thing that I wish I knew was where to find like a database of adapted workouts and experienced coaches that I could have drawn from and asked questions so that I didn't feel so out of depth um, when starting. Um, I think instructors definitely need to start to use what is familiar with them when starting in adapted workouts so that they don't feel like they're walking into an exam underprepared. Um, before sessions, perhaps try to get comments from participants, parents, carers on the access needs and trying to gauge what's familiar to the participants so that they can develop their sessions from there. Yeah, that's a really good point about starting with something you know, I suppose, instead of going, okay, well, I usually do HIT, but I'm going to now try and do adaptive yoga. You know, um, if, if that's also new to you, that's just a double, you know, um, double newness, I guess. Um, do you, either of you, have any kind of more advice you would give to instructors and people working in sport who are looking to offer more inclusive sessions? Um, Carly, do you want to go or should I... Okay. Um, I think the advice I would give is I'll try to take into account the physical, emotional and mental needs of each individual. Um, no two people will be the same. And of course, no two days will be the same. Um, be prepared to think on your feet as sessions may not always go to plan. But the beauty about planning is that there's always room for interpretation and reinterpretation. Um, make sure that the language that you're using is inclusive to all and importantly i think ensure that you have a welcoming and open body language if you're nervous try and take that nervous energy and use it turn it into confidence and take a deep breath yeah um i think just to add to that as well um don't be afraid before the session um to 
you know be honest and say I tend to say to clients including my own husband you know um I is there anything you know that you just don't want to try today or are you up for trying anything everything do you want us to um if something doesn't feel right you know let me know I want you to feel empowered to move in ways that feel good to you um and uh, I, I mean I would say this to literally anybody who comes to my classes regardless of ability I want you to feel empowered to move in ways that feel good to you um because that's what's going to get the best out of you about the, the kind of workout that you're having um I think as coaches um as instructors we all have the ability to um to regress and progress things so we know how to make things easier or more, more achievable we know how to make things harder and more challenging um I think it's worth kind of starting to learn a bank of things about adapting things as well so um this works as well if you come to you with injuries so you can adapt workouts um uh, and you're not kind of so uh you don't have that kind of look of oh my goodness what should I say next uh to someone so you want to maintain that confidence and make sure that someone feels cared for and looked after so it is worth buying a couple of books watching some videos to see how you can adapt movements and just feel that little bit more confident about things Absolutely, that's so true. Thank you very much for the for the thoughts. I think they'll be really helpful for people. Um, and finally, I guess the last question that I'd like to ask you both, but um, feel free to answer either from you know your experience coaching or just your general thoughts. But what do you think are the next steps that the sports sector needs in general to become more inclusive? Either of you to take the field first. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll, I'll start. Um, personally, I think next steps include more representation on all levels, more educational opportunities, free and or low cost. Um, I think definitely more sporting and work experience for intersectional communities, more representative broadcasting of different sports and TV presenters, um, showing diversity in voice, experience and life experience. I think there's definitely a need for more accessible pitches, stadiums, basketball courts, just accessibility all around. Um, yeah, I could say so much more on this, you know, <laughs> but I don't think we have enough time. Yeah, it's a long way to go. Yeah, very long way. Um, I think if I can just add to that as well, I've been really, really disappointed at the number of um, studios who have went online for... Um, or lockdown and have come offline now it's just really made me kind of think you're just chasing the money you're not thinking about individual experiences at all I've seen it in my own house where um, the online experience meant that accessibility was suddenly so much better for my husband um, and it's just been a really rubbish thing to kind of suddenly feel like the world's become even less accessible after lockdown kind of eased than it was before it felt inaccessible before and then this whole new world has been opened up and now it feels even more inaccessible because it's like the door's been shut because people with disabilities just aren't seen as important um so that's really made me annoyed and i think i've been speaking to a few particularly individuals and we've kind of made a pledge to say we will stay online but even if that's just i mean i'm staying online a lot but even just for a couple of classes to make sure that we are still providing for that larger audience and it is inclusive so it's not just saying that you're inclusive or saying that you're accessible but actually being inclusive and accessible and thinking about other barriers as well so language that you're using in your advertising to make sure that it is clear that you're still accessible um, and also things like cost so looking at ways that you can reach people where it's not just this kind of privileged line here which people can't even they can't even access the accessible stuff you know so I do think there's there's a huge way to go, um, but I think the, it starts with kind of if you actually mean it, act on it, just do something about it, you know. Easier said than done, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, taking those first steps. Um, yeah, is there anything else that either of you would like to say to conclude before we see if anyone has any questions in the chat? If anyone does have any questions, put them in the chat now. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Greg, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything specific to add, just we need to keep driving that inclusion, that narrative of accessibility being normal, 
um, and normalizing what we do here as well. As Carly said, um, it's such a shame that people who started online now that lockdown is ending are, are moving, removing these access, um, this access away from people who, who need it. Um, but we need to we need to do better. Definitely. And that's why um, a lot of people are asking us, um, I think Elaine asked us just a moment ago, when we're going back to in-person sessions. And that is, of course, something that um, DSC is looking at. But we think it's really important to be keeping some of our DSC at home stuff going, um, even when hopefully we're all back to normal. Um, yeah, so that it's everyone has options. And, you know, so many people have various different um, health conditions or intersecting needs that mean that even if the infrastructure is back to normal you know not everyone's going to feel comfortable going back to in person at the same time so yeah that's so true Carly did you have any thoughts you'd like to add yeah I think just don't be afraid I think um, as coaches you you've got your insurance and it allows you to work with certain sectors um, and so if somebody comes to you with a certain uh, need or requirement you kind of go I can't sorry I absolutely can't and the idea is if you, if you aren't sure to work with someone you should refer them but I think um, there's a conversation to be had there with that person as an individual, you know, Bri was saying is one-on-one, -on -one. it's a case-by-case -case basis, it's each individual person. Um, and if this is something which you really do stand by as a coach, you know, and I'm certainly not trying to, um, you know, plug you here from DSC, but I've just signed up to do um, the, uh, the disability awareness in sport course, because I didn't even realise it existed. And I was like, I've probably done enough now with people to need to get qualified for this and to, to start to learn a bit more about it. So I do think, um, you know, it was, it was affordable and it means a lot to me as a coach to be signed up to do that. Um, and it's just, I, I mean, I said it before, but you just, if you're going to do this, you really have to act on it. Don't be afraid to work with people and also don't be afraid to get those extra qualifications so you feel more confident in working with everybody. Yep. I think uh, Abby wanted to say something. Oh yeah, this is also, I know Zoe's a botcher player because I know Zoe. Um, and what I um, find is accessibility for disabled loos and changing facilities is absolutely atrocious. Yeah, thumbs up from Zoe. I saw a picture the other day from a friend, I think you know C, don't you? Zoe, C Turk? went into a disabled toilet, brand new facility, and the emergency cord was hanging up in the window. So if there was any accidents, no one could, you wouldn't be able to reach the cord. So I think what I would like to see is the facilities that us coaches use have got all their protocols up to date. Yeah, um, I know as well, and so he's nodding that half the time in some sessions I work, because I'm a freelance coach as well, the lifts are not working. How is a member, if we're trying to get up into a dance studio, which tends to be on the upper floor, how are our members supposed to be able to access these sessions? So I think as an organisation and as coach for inclusive sports, we need to make sure that the facilities we use have the right code of conduct and are accessible to everyone. And I'm a great believer in that. That's all I've got to say, actually. Thank you. I've had me moan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Debbie. I, I completely agree, though, Debbie. Yeah. I've seen um, accessible loos used for, like, storage half the time. And, you know, you go to use them and they've just got stuff in them. And the people are like, oh, well, no, well, we didn't think anyone was going to use them. And you're fuming about it, absolutely fuming about it. But I, I do think, I, I mean, my husband is always like, please don't cause a fuss. And I'm like, no, I am going to cause a fuss. And I'm kind of, you know, you have to, and I, because I'm going to use, my able body privilege to be like, no, I'm speaking to people who might just think, oh, you know, I don't want to be the, the person who's causing the fuss. Like, no, I am going to say something. And so you have to sort this out. And if I'm working in a place where they're using disabled blue for potting all their mops and cleaning stuff, I will always say this is not on. And it, you know, it can really get the back of your manager up, but I'd rather, I'm, I'm going to stand by what I believe in. It's not on to be doing that with the, the facilities. And it does happen and it's really bad. You just have to be that nagging voice. Mm. of people who might be too nervous to stand up for it. And parking spaces is another issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, so I do lots of um, botcha, which most of our uh, members are in chairs, motorised chairs, and the amounts of times we turn up for sessions and 
the car park is for and all the disabled bays are used. So again, it comes back to the facility. Are they up to date? And making sure that we kind of link up from every stage, I suppose, as well, you know, from the instructor to the facility to, you know, any middle, you know, management sort of roles. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that insight, Debbie. Um, we've got one more question from Amadeep. Um, he says, um, he wants to know, in your opinion, are there any mainstream providers who you think are doing well, quote unquote well, when it comes to accessibility or raising awareness of inclusive and adapted activities? Oh. Yeah, I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I can think of people who um, aren't afraid to give it a try when asked, but aren't necessarily um, marketing and uh, kind of giving that information without being asked, definitely. Mm. I don't know about you, Greer, can you think of anyone? Um, I can think of a few, but I okay. have to question whether it's a performative action or whether they actually yeah. do it to drive that change. To see yeah. brands like Nike and Adidas always advertising and having, I guess, different people in their marketing campaigns. Um, but is it a true depiction of what they actually believe, of what they're actually doing? Or is it just because of what's happening right now? And is it going to continue? Mm. That question is a, it's a good question. But I don't know if I have the answer. I'm, I'm not, not sure. Yeah, I think one thing is to look at, you know, their, you know, keep the house, how they run their house kind of thing. Um, with Nike, there's definitely a lot of things that have come out about employee treatment and things like that. So, um, yeah, like you say, a lot of a lot of brands and organisations are trying to put out the right message, but potentially not looking at their own structures. So, yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. Raised. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amadeets, for giving me a thumbs up. So thank you for your... Um, well, I think, unless anyone's got any other questions, I would just like to give both of you the opportunity to plug anything that you've got going on that you think our members might be interested in, and then I'll give you a quick rundown of, of what we've got coming up next. Carly, is there anything that you'd like to mention? Um... Yes, I've got a couple of free um, online seated workouts on YouTube, which I would love. Um, I would love people to try, and I would love feedback on. Um, I'm sorry about my jokes; they're really bad. They really are. But <laughs> if you have a look at Project HB Fitness, um, you'll be able to find them. Uh, and I would just love to create more if people want them. So please do have a look and send me feedback. I'd be really up for making them even better. Okay, Grace, is there anything you'd like to mention? Um, yes, I'm actually going to post the link in the chat. So we have um, a project called the Summer Park Series happening this Saturday and next Tuesday. It'll be great for whoever wants to be involved to be involved. So Saturday we have a session in Sutton and at Paddington Rec. And next Tuesday we have a session at Burgess Park between 1 and 4 and Battersea Park at the same time. Um, so let me know if you'd like to to join, send me an email, um, click on the link, all of the information is there. Great, thanks Grew. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. So one other thing that, um, or a couple of other things that I'd like to mention, um, we've got a session this evening at 5.30, which is um, kind of coach training session. So um, I think most of you are members, but if anyone would like to join in that or recommend it to anyone, then there will be a link um, it's the same link for all our sessions, so um, if anyone would like to pass that along, then that's at 5.30 on Zoom. And we also have, like Kylie mentioned, our e-learning course, which is um, ongoing and anyone can take it. And it's a really good introduction to inclusive um, and language and things like that. So, um, yeah, that is everything. Um, so... Uh, Let's see if I've got anything else to say. Yes. Um, so essentially, thank you both for joining. It's been so brilliant to hear you both talk um, about so many different aspects of accessibility. So thank you, Carly. Um, so Carly's handle on, I think everything is Project HB. So if you'd like to yep. follow her. Yeah. Um, which is happy body, which is yes, always happy body. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Greer, you can find 
everywhere um, the <laughs> movement as well and Girls United and DSC. Um, so thank you both. Um, so our next session is um, the Paralympic Heritage Experience, so the history of the Paralympics and that is at 2.30. Um, so if you'd be interested in joining the next session which is um, running collaboration with the Paralympic Heritage Trust then please do join in again at 2.30. Um, and yes, if you enjoyed the session or any other session, please consider leaving us a, a small donation. You can um, do that on our website if you would like to. But um, of course, the main thing is that you've enjoyed the session and um, we'd love to see you again. So thank you everyone. Um, I'm gonna end the, I'm gonna stop recording now. And then,